Don't buy a Karambit until you watch this part one rebooted and how that video almost got me into a fist fight. Coming up in this video. All right guys, so this video is gonna be kind of fun, but I have to give you a little bit of a backstory first. So like three years ago, I made a video that was entitled, Don't Buy a Karambit Until You Watch This. Now there's a part two for that, which is a follow-up video. I'll put a link for that in the description in case you guys wanna check that out. But the first part had gotten flagged and then eventually got taken down. And I'll explain that in just a second. The video itself was about four minutes long. We'll play it in just a moment. I want you guys to be able to watch it. And the whole point of the video is that if you're gonna buy a karambit as an everyday carry or as a self-defense tool, the karambit has some specific characteristics that require additional training that's specific to the karambit. So if you're gonna buy one, cool, but just get the training that goes along with it. I don't want you to learn something in the middle of a fight. Do the road work now. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Wrong. The internet broke. Every single YouTube black belt, keyboard warrior, uh, internet expert, whatever you want to call it, came out and was just bringing in the hate. In the first 30 days, I probably had 98,000 views, I had about 12,000 likes, I had about 3,000 dislikes, and I had about 2,500 comments, of which about 500 comments were really colorful. And when I say that, here's what I mean. Aside from throwing some shade at me, which honestly, I just don't care, I don't have to validate myself to anyone, but people were bickering amongst themselves and that led to personal insults, then that led to like threats, and then that led to like racial derogatory comments. In all honesty, when YouTube got a hold of that and sent me the notification saying that they pulled the video, I gotta be honest, I wasn't too pissed off because I don't want this channel to become a forum for that kind of behavior. Look, if you guys wanna discuss, debate, uh, add something to the conversation, cool, that's what the comment section's for. But if you wanna act like a fool, take that elsewhere. I just don't want it here, okay? I want everybody to feel welcome, and I wanna make sure that we're providing value and an opportunity to have a discussion. Anyways, so I'm gonna let you guys watch this video, and after the video, we'll come back and I'll give you some additional comments on it, I'll give you some history about the Karambit, and I actually wanna do a little bit of show and tell with you guys uh, and show you guys some stuff. I brought some cool karambits with me that I think you guys will appreciate. So let's start off by getting into the video and I'll see you guys back here in just a minute. Hey guys, Nick here from S2 Strategic Defense and the S2 Online Academy. Wanted to make a real quick video for you guys about an ongoing conversation that I have, uh, which is where I tell people to not buy a karambit for their primary blade system for their everyday carry for a self-defense type of a knife. Now, if you guys like the karambit, you're trained with the karambit, more power to you but for the average person who has not ever played with the Karambit, doesn't understand what makes the Karambit so powerful, is also the same things that makes it so limiting. I wanna make this quick video for you guys and give you guys my side of the fence over here. For those of you who don't know what a Karambit is, this is a Karambit. Uh, you can tell a Karambit always by the curvature. Okay, It looks like a claw. It hails from the uh, Malaysian and Indonesian martial arts as even as their tertiary blade, meaning they had a long blade, they had a short straight blade and then they had one of these. In the original Karambit was, wasn't this big. It had the same handle size, but it only had a short blade that came out about 90 degrees from the bottom of the hand. And uh, they tried to hide the knife in their hand-to-hand -hand combat. So the, the old adage is, your hand-to-hand -hand combat is your conversation, that's your sentence. Your weapon, your Karambit, is the exclamation point. That's the punctuation behind the sentence. I tell people to not purchase the Karambit blade because honestly, I really don't find it to be a great primary edged weapon. Are they good tools? Yes, they are. Are they powerful? Yes, they are. Are they extremely violent? Yes, they are. With the underlying message that you have to train with them a lot to get good at them. So now what you have is a bunch of people who are buying karambits because that's the cool thing to do. Everybody's doing it. People are watching, you know, Doug Marqueda videos and like buying a karambit because they think they're gonna move like Doug Marqueda. Do you know how much time Doug Marqueda has behind a karambit? Thousands of hours to, to flow the way he flows, and he's amazing, okay? 
for most people, I always recommend that you pick up a straight blade. Okay, now most states uh, don't allow you to have a fixed blade, but they will allow you to have a folder in your pocket. Um, check your local you know, laws and stuff to make sure that you're on par with what they're saying, but a straight blade is a, definitely a better way to go. Let me show you a few reasons why. First and foremost is the distancing. From, from tail to tip, a straight blade will always cover more distance than a karambit that's pointed downwards and then outwards. Okay, so that's one part of it. And distance is your friend when it comes to edge weapons and self-defense. We wanna be able to maintain a particular distance to keep somebody away from us, right? That's one reason. Second reason why I say that is the universal dynamics of movement, meaning being able to slash, being able to thrust, being able to side to side slash, being able to pick up or pick up. All those are common universal dynamics of movement. They apply with a blunt striking object, they apply with an edged weapon, they apply with a bunch of different things. But if you have a karambit, because of the shape and the configuration of it, well, how do I slash? Well, you don't. You have to slash this way. How do I thrust? Well, you can't thrust. You have to be able to pick the knife up. In the karambit, you're scooping quite a bit, you're passing quite a bit, you're hooking quite a bit, you're doing all these different things that are really advanced tactics, okay? Advanced manipulations of the body. There's a lot of fine motor and complex motor things happening. We're making articulations in the wrist. We're playing with the ring that goes around the finger to be able to adjust the blade into position. You don't do any of those things with a straight blade. And until you spend a lot of time playing with the karambit, it just never comes into play for you. It's not a good defensive edge weapon choice. Lastly, when you talk about a straight blade, all the movements are intuitive. Slashing's intuitive, thrusting's intuitive, big slashes are intuitive. You don't have to hook, pick, circle, any of those things, all right? So I've always said that the straight blade version is always better than the karambit version. Now that being said, where does a karambit really shine that a straight blade doesn't? Well, karambits in grappling or on the ground or extreme close quarters are very powerful tools. But again, that's not your primary blade system. You got into that clinch, that close quarter, because you don't have any other weaponry available. So now you have to be able to deploy a short blade, start cycling the knife through the lungs, through the rib cage, through the, through the armpit, a bunch of different tactics that come involved with the karambit. You don't have to do any of those things with a straight blade. All right, guys, so hopefully that helps. Hopefully that answers some questions, gives you guys something to think about. If you have any questions, comment down below, and uh, make sure you guys like, share, subscribe, pass this video around, and we'll see you guys in the next one. All right, guys, so that's the main video. Let me know in the comments section if you found any of that to be controversial. But for now, let's get back to the main story. Now, this is where things get really interesting, and it sets the stage for everything that happens in the future, so follow along. So one of the uh, main reasons why that video got so much attention, so much play, is because there's two guys that uh, own their own companies that design, manufacture, and retail their own versions of a karambit along with other blades. And one of them was pretty popular for about five minutes. As soon as these guys got a hold of the video, it was instant fire, instant hate. They're in the comment sections, they're badgering me, and I didn't even know why. So I replied, and I started asking them some basic questions, and it took like five minutes to make it obvious, just evident, clear as day, that these guys had no clue on how to actually fight with the knife, how to actually use the knife. Now, they might be great manufacturers or great designers, I don't know, I don't have any of their products, but I'm a training guy. Everything I look at goes through the lens of functional application. And the video was about using the knife, not about the build quality of a knife, right? So I don't even know why they're mad, but they're mad. So when they realized that they started looking like idiots, they basically called in the cavalry, literally. They reached out to their circle, their social media, their YouTube channels, their newsletters, whatever, and instructed people to come over to my video and start putting in negative comments. Now I know this to be a fact because back in those days, YouTube had an inbox, you could message a channel. And right away I had probably 11 or 12 people that messaged me saying, hey, so-and-so instructed me to come over to your video and put these kinds of comments in, but I watched your video so I just don't want to comment at all. 
Uh, but I wanted you to know what's going on. So appreciate for the guys uh, that did message me because at least it gave me an idea of why so much hate was coming my way. Anyways, I still had this massive influx of people coming in commenting in a negative light. And so I started to banter back and forth with all of them. Meanwhile, YouTube picked it up on the algorithm saying that there's a bunch of activity happening on this video and they put it in suggested videos. So now I have exposure from, from a completely different uh, group of people. Now that group that came in was like an 80-20 split. 80% of them were very positive, supportive, had questions, we had good discussions, and 20% of them were kind of knuckleheads. Now the problem isn't with the knuckleheads bantering me, they started bantering amongst each other. And that led to personal insult, personal insult led to death threat, death threat led to racism. It just started getting uglier and uglier. Now let me point something out to you guys too. I want this channel or any channel that I'm a part of to be a positive place. I want to welcome everybody, whether you agree, disagree, or want to debate or discuss anything. We're cool as long as it's done respectfully. The minute you guys start acting like fools, I'm gonna start treating them like fools. So if you have something to disagree on, cool, let's talk about it. If you agree with something, cool, let's talk about it. But the, when it starts to go into racism and you know death threats, I mean, literally, I was sitting there like half a dozen times a day deleting people or blocking comments. I was just getting uglier and uglier. Anyways, let's take a second and talk about something else. So inside that video, I was giving you guys some history about the Karambit, so let me expand on that briefly. The Karambit, like uh, most weapons that came in out of martial arts, started as a farm tool and then got weaponized. Now the mistake that people make is that they think it comes from Filipino Kali, right? The Filipino martial arts, and that's wrong. The Karambit actually hails from the Indonesian and Malaysian martial arts called Silat, S-I-L-A-T. And it was a tertiary blade, third in line. They had their long blade, which was about the size of a machete, maybe a little bit longer. Then they had their fixed dagger, eight to 12 inches long. And then they had the karambit, which was the concealed weapon. And that karambit didn't look anything like today's karambit it looks like. As a matter of fact, it looked like this, okay? It was about a four inch handle that was made out of wood, bone, or ivory. It had about an inch and a half blade that was raked 90 degrees to the handle and it had a lanyard that was really long. Why did they have a long lanyard? Well, they used to start wrapping the lanyard, then place the karambit on top of it, and then wrap it again. So now the karambit is sandwiched inside of that lanyard, and they could put it under their sleeve and conceal it. The karambit was used under specific applications, meaning this. They got disarmed of their weapons in the middle of combat. So if they didn't have anything else, that was the last ditch go-to. Or they had some kind of a prohibited area, and some of the villages had their original gun-free zones, right? And then the third version was, even their hand-to-hand -hand combatives oftentimes were uh, to the death, historically speaking. And the way to get an advantage in an unarmed fight is to be armed. And so they used to hide it under their sleeve and wrap it up, so that way when they're in the middle of their fight, they could pull it out. If you ever study anything from Silat and you take a look at things like the Puder Kapala or the Gaja series, you see how their hand motions are a perfect match for using a blade, especially the shape of a karambit, and you can see where that fits in. And so that's kind of the basic history of how the karambit was. Now, I'm pretty sure it happened earlier, but not commonly. It wasn't until the, like the 60s or so when the Indonesian uh, martial arts masters, the Silat masters, started exchanging information with the Filipino Kali people, right? And so the blade, even at that time, was not accepted into Filipino martial arts. As a matter of fact, they called it a rooster's gaff. They used to use that blade, take it off of the handle, and tie it to the feet of roosters and use, use it for cockfighting. You guys understand that? Later on, they found some applications for it, but for the most part, if you talk to some of the old school Kali practitioners to this day, they still don't accept the karambit as a part of their thing. That's an Americanized thing, or that's a modernized demand that came into Kali that popularized the karambit. Back to the main story. So like I was saying, we had a whole bunch of banter going on in the comments section. 
I had this rapid influx of people coming in, some of them from those two ass hats doing unethical behaviors, and then the rest of them from YouTube suggested videos. Either way, I was killing it in the analytics. The view count was up, I was getting a whole bunch of likes, I was stacking up on the dislikes, the comment section was going crazy, I picked up a bunch of subscribers. Hell, at the time, I only had like 2,100 subscribers, okay? A bunch of people that are here came from that video, so good job, guys. Welcome to the dark side. Anyways, so this went on for about four to five months, and eventually, due to the colorful nature of some of the debates in the comment section, somebody complained, YouTube flagged the video, and eventually they took it down. I wasn't even mad, I don't want this channel to become a forum for that kind of behavior, but I do have one regret. I wish the video was monetized. How sweet would it have been to contact these dudes and been like, hey guys, thanks for the exposure, you're pissed off and I'm getting paid, have a nice day. How sweet would that have been? Uh, hindsight's 2020. At the closing of the video, I had like 300 some odd thousand uh, views. I had like 18,000 likes, like 6,000 dislikes, and like 6,000 comments. That was a lot for a small channel like this one. So fast forward like four months later, I was scheduled to be at the Blade Show in Atlanta, Georgia. I go every year, I'm there with my vendors doing product demos and glad handing with people. If you guys are going uh, this year, I'll be there. Let me know, I'd love to meet up with you guys. Anyway, so I just gotten done at one of my vendors and I had to be at a different vendor in about 20 minutes and I was starving. So I ran out in the hallway, I grabbed a pretzel and something to drink and I was walking back in when out of the corner of my eye, I saw this uh, vendor table and a logo on the backdrop and I was like, God, I think I know that logo. Do I know these guys? Do I not know them? Are they friends? Are they friends of friends? I couldn't think of it and suddenly it hit me. You got it. It was these guys or at least it was one of these guys. And so I thought about this really deeply for a second. Okay, I was having an introvert moment, some self-reflection. I'm like, should I go over there? Should I not go over there? Should I go over there? Should I not go over there? And I'm looking around at the table and there's like four or five dudes standing there helping out at the table. And so I said, screw it. I'm going over there. I'm going to give these guys an autograph. And so I start making a beeline over there. Let me tell you what this kind of felt like, okay? It kind of felt like a mix between a few things. One, if you guys remember the original Karate Kid when Daniel's on the beach and the Cobra, guy, uh, the Cobra Kai guys have him surrounded, a mix between that and then in the 80s there was a movie called The Warriors. It was about uh, two rival gangs in the Coney Island area. And there's a scene in there where one of the guys was taunting a rival gang. And he had these... Uh, glass beer bottles on his fingers and he was clanking them together, tink, 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 and he's like, warriors, come out and play, eh? Let me just play this for you. Warriors, come out to play, eh? Warriors, come out to play, eh? Anyways, so I'm making a beeline over to this table. Now, a couple of those guys saw me walking over, they recognize me, and they're kind of elbowing each other like, and they're having some whispering conversations, right? And the tension's kind of building up. I'm making a straight beeline. They know who I am. They know that I know who they are. So let's do a little bit of show and tell real quick, okay? I brought a handful of things for you guys to take a look at. And uh, for those of you guys who have not seen a Karambit, this is the original Karambit or orig kind of an original design of the Karambit, I should say. Uh, basic, you guys probably seen these all the time. They have the retention ring. There's a curvature behind the blade. This is like a cheap $20 or $30 type of thing that I bought on Amazon. I bought like 30 of these things because I wanted them at my uh, last martial arts academy for my students to play with. So I'm not going to spend $200 on a knife that everybody's just going to beat on anyway. So, you know, that's a karambit. If you're going to buy something like that, try and buy a, a, a trainer that's similar. I think I bought this for like uh, 15 or 18 bucks on Amazon also. And same type of deal. At least it's not sharp, it's not pointy. With the right gear, you could work on this thing and play with it and do some contact kind of stuff. One of the things that you see all the time with people who are buy karambits is they kind of spin these things around and then eventually it comes back and it stabs them right in the wrist, okay? And then they start bleeding profusely. It's a common thing. It happens all the time. A different kind of a karambit, you could use it in a forward grip. 
Uh, this is an example of that. You could take a regular Quran bit if it's a folder that way and flip the uh, pocket clip over. Now it'll be in forward type of a uh, configuration instead of this kind of a configuration, right? So you can hold it this way instead if you have to. So here's a, what we call it under the shirt kind of a knife. It has a chain attached to it. You know, you put it on, you put your shirt right over it. And if you ever got in trouble, you would deploy the knife as such. Now this is called a double agent. It's made by Cold Steel. This is the double agent one. The double agent two has the reverse uh, grip of the knife, okay? So that's an option. And then uh, this was actually made for me. There's a gentleman who made two of these, one for a buddy of mine who's a former special operations guy from the United States Marine Corps, and then one for me. And uh, this is what this looks like. This is awesome. I love this thing. It's not sharp. It's made out of aluminum. And I call this not the karambit, but the karambite because of the uh, sprags that's all over it. Good way to train. It's got the heel on it. So if you guys ever want to, you know, flick it out and hit somebody in the face with it or whatever, kind of a non-lethal kind of a weapon that's, I don't know, kind of inconspicuous, right? You can put this in your pocket. It's not a knife. It's not an impact weapon. It's just kind of menacing looking, right? So it's kind of cool. So anyway, those are the basics of a karambit. You guys should pay attention to these things. Not all of them are folders. They come in a fixed blade as well. As a matter of fact, the originals are a fixed blade, but follow the laws in your state. All right, guys, I'd like to take a minute and show you a couple things real quick uh, that you gotta be careful of in using the karambit, whether you already have one, whether you plan on buying one, or whether you think that it's the coolest thing since sliced bread, I got it but you still should be aware of some of the pitfalls and spend some time training with it. So one of the things that makes the karambit so popular, especially in the American market, is that feature right there, the retention ring. The problem with the retention ring is that people use it incorrectly. Let me explain. This is an as needed feature, but the problem with it is, is people get so comfortable to putting their finger inside of it, they leave it inside there. And so the feature that's giving you a little bit of extra leverage and mobility with the blade also has now become a noose around your finger. So the debate is that the retention ring allows you to draw the knife a little bit faster. That part's true, no problems there. But then they say, and it's impossible to disarm, and that's where the problem comes in. So when people put their finger inside this thing, when we try to disarm a regular non-retention ring knife, we try to get that out of their hand, get the hand to open up and drop the knife. But when it comes to any kind of a knife that has this retention ring, we try to dismember or deglove. Let me show you what I mean. The idea is to put leverage on the side of the blade so the knife gets locked up against the bone and then blow right through it, trying to rip the finger off of the hand. It's a lot like learning disarms with a firearm. Why do we tell people to take their finger outside of the trigger guard? Because when we snap that gun around, we don't want them to lose their finger. Same thing happens here. The other concept is de-glove. So instead of putting enough pressure in to tear the finger off, we lock the knife up and then we strip it. So we're pulling on the knife, hoping to take the meat off of the bone. Now that doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened multiple times. A few years ago, a little bit before that first video came out, myself and two other instructors got hired out as consultants for a manufacturer who's making karambits. And so they were having problems with their customers getting hurt inside of the retention ring. So what we did was change the design a little bit. We elongated it. We changed the diameter. We changed the chamfer on the inside of the retention ring. And in the final revision, we asked them to put a copper liner inside of it. Copper is a softer material, allowing the uh, retention ring to slide off a little bit easier. Is it perfect? No, but it is a lot better than where we started from. So you got to be careful of that. And look, I have knives that have retention rings. As a matter of fact, my backup blade has a retention ring. This is the Picor from Bastinelli Knives, and Bastion does a great job. Instead of chamfering, he makes the entire uh, retention ring circular, okay? So that way it slides off the finger. Is that perfect? No, but again, it's much better than where we started from. So I don't have a problem with the karambit. I don't have a problem with the retention ring. I don't have a problem with any of this stuff. I have a problem with people buying something not understanding the characteristics and not putting in the time to train with it. The other thing that I want to show you guys is this. When you have a karambit that's got this curved kind of a blade, people stunt this like a balasong or a butterfly knife. And so when they spin it around, a lot of times 
they'll anchor the tip of the knife right into their wrist. Now you have a lot of veins and arteries there. If it gets in deep enough, you got yourself a whole lot of problems and that happens all of the time. So that's something you gotta be careful of. It's one of the mistakes that comes out from putting your finger in knuckle deep. The, the retention ring is supposed to be shallow, okay? And that allows the blade, the uh, alignment of the blade to be straight. The minute you go in deep, it changes the angle of the blade. And so when it comes around, it comes around at this angle. Get it? And so you end up stabbing yourself. So those are a couple things that you gotta be careful of with the karambit. So let's talk about the rest of the story, huh? So there I am at the blade show, uh, walking through. I recognize this guy standing at the table and his buddies. I know that logo. These are the guys that were giving me a hard time on YouTube in the comments section, and not just me. I don't really care if somebody has something to say about me. I know who I am, I know where I come from. I don't have to validate for anyone. But their behavior with other people who are trying to comment is, you just can't condone that kind of stuff, right? They're keyboard warriors. They're, they're tough behind the screen. And so I feel like I should probably say something. So I'm on my way over to them to give them an autograph. And these guys see me coming, they come out from behind the table and they're kind of nudging each other's elbows and whispering to each other. They see me coming, they know who I am. I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna say when I got there, but I figured I'll wing it, I'll, I'll come up with something. So I get to the table, the main guy stand there, I'm like, hey, my name's Nick, I'm with S2 Strategic Defense. I had this video on YouTube and you jumped on and we were having a banter. That part was cool, but why did you have all of these other people jump on in? What kind of unethical BS is that? And he totally denied it. So I pulled up my phone, I opened up the YouTube inbox, I showed him the messages, I showed him the name, showed him like who sent it and all this stuff, right? And he's still denying this thing. Like, dude, are all these people lying? So this kind of went back and forth for a minute and I was getting bored and tired and I needed to get to the other vendor, right? So I said this, I said, look man, it is what it is. So let's just say that you didn't. Either which way, we shouldn't be having that kind of exchange anywhere, let alone on YouTube. And you shouldn't be having people come to my channel to spread negativity. But I'll tell you what, you're a knife manufacturer, I'm a training guy. You have some beautiful looking trainers sitting on the table. So let's grab those and I'll give you your first lesson on the house right now. And so the guy kind of backs up and he's like, he's like, look man, I'm, I didn't, you know, that's not me and yada yada, whatever. And so I'm like, look man, again, I'm just here to give you a free lesson. That's it. And his buddies are kind of standing around over there, but they're not doing much. They're just kind of waiting to see if this thing pops off or not. And so I kind of looked at them and I said, how about you guys? You guys want a free lesson right now? Grab a trainer. Let's have a conversation. And so they didn't want any either. And so eventually I just kind of told the guy, listen, man, you stay away from my channel. I'll stay away from your channel and we don't have a problem. But if this thing continues on, if you try to repeat that behavior where you have your cronies getting a hold of me, we're going to have a real problem. And I left it at that and kind of walked away. And I was kind of glad. I'm not trying to ruin this event for anybody else who came to have a good time. But I needed to say something because too many people are real tough behind a keyboard. They lost uh, the art of being able to debate respectfully, okay? And so sometimes you got to call them out on it. And it is what it is. Anyways, guys, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the story time. And if this has been helpful for you, maybe you learned something out of this, saw something out of it, maybe you got a laugh out of it, do me a favor. Like, share, subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and I hope to see you guys on the next video.